dedicate most of the time to a discussion of the problems one sees working with uh, true text and adopting a <coughs> method of phonological reconstructions the way they are really dead by people that they will try to make sense out of text when they need to translate them. That, that's my experience. I basically translated the, the Guodian and, and the Shambo text completely and I had just to deal with the kind of choices that are made to make readable texts. How do you choose between one judge and how to do another? How you see what the prevailing strategies in the fields are, which are not always strategies that conform to like best phonological candidates, best phonological matches. So mainly uh, I deal with these points uh, in, in a sequence. The, what I believe are the main features of, of the book, of the new system. Uh, how they deal with new manuscript sources, but especially how this how scholars basically uh, approach these sources, what are the common tools they use, what are the common problems met by scholars. Then I will focus specifically on the usage of Barjevan's dictionary in the book as a way to test some hypotheses and to see some counterexample in the spirit of uh, very explicit in the book of falsifiability. I mean, really making claims that can be tested one way or another. And specifically, we look at some detail, like three examples. And then I will look at some other examples related to related problems from excavating texts, and I will offer a quick conclusion. Now, uh, we, uh, we are three of us from University of Washington, and we were trained in, with this book. We were trained with Baxter's book. It was our way into into old Chinese. But in a way, compared to the approach taken by the 2014 books, it's a traditional approach in the sense that if you compare it with the testability of the, of the claims and the, the structure of the hypothesis, uh, this, the new book has certainly bolder hypothesis uh, from a point of view of really epistemology. But it's not only because of epistemology, it's mostly Good part at least because of new sources, I mean, new sources of material, Mong Yen, Tai Padai, things that are brought uh, into the system, and also much more recourse to internal reconstruction, the morphology of old Chinese prefixes, and so on. At the same time, there is this issue of the hypothetical deductive approach. I, I'm intrigued by this explicitly, uh, this approach coming basically from of science, this way that you test things, just like in the Einstein example, very famous, that uh, was tested by an eclipse between two kind of claims. Obviously, the, the Einstein claim is a claim that basically comes not because of a slow addition of like new data that brings to some more generalized hypothesis. It comes from some conceptual breakthrough that then needs to be tested. But when you test it, you find out uh, how it compares with the established method. At the same time, <coughs> looking specifically, and I just limit myself to the script, the true script, looking specifically at some uh, usages of this, of data from the script into the book, into the system, sometimes there are issues of uh, falsifiability. I mean, can really these claims be tested? To which extent they can be tested? Obviously, <coughs> even if they are only partially tested, but the way they can be tested can be improved. This is also part of a normal way you build uh, this hypothetical reductive system. Now, I want very briefly to go through the three main corpora we have for true script. Uh, most of us are very familiar with it, a few maybe are not, and this anyway allows me to go back to the fact that the data that come out of, uh, that constitute true script that are in Barulan's dictionary of phonetic loans come from single texts. And these texts have different features. For example, uh, the, the Guadian, which are basically the first that really 
wrote us into extended uh, usage of, of true bamboo manuscripts. Uh, he uh, comes from uh, an archaeological excavation. We are sure of the source. <laughs> it has been studied for more than 20 years. And this translation, very thickly annotated by Scott Crook, is basically it's really a point of reference. The way we treat uh, the data coming from Guodian are not the same as the way we treat uh, data coming from the Shanghai Museum manuscript. Uh, the strip is very, very similar. They've been related, and now basically you don't uh, do, uh, when you look at a graph in, in the Guardian that has yet to be it's kind of puzzled to be solved, you immediately use data from the Shanghai manuscripts. I mean, the two things are interrelated, they're just one field. Uh, and I'm particularly fond and familiar with this because I, I went through the trouble of trying to create a complete translation of them. I mean, some of them are broken in, in the order is unclear. Some of them are more incomplete than others. Uh, overall, uh, most people would agree that they reflect just one kind of script. Uh, some texts overlap. Uh, we have the same text in the Korean and in the Shang. Uh, at the same time, the problems are more extended. Sometimes when we look at one passage in one of these texts, we need to be aware that, well, uh, the text could be really incomplete. Um, there are even issues if the text could be forged. And then generally speaking, these texts are accepted as being authentic. But this is not the same as having texts in, that come from two in an archaeological uh, setting. Uh, the third corpus that is coming into full fruition, but is still just been uh, published year by year, we are going forward with the Ching Pan manuscript. Again, we are not sure about the provenance of this. Uh, I would like very briefly, basically, we will not really go into this passage, we will go uh, into the table that comes from this passage. Uh, this is a translation by Cook of two passages. From the other, one from Sinsen Minchu, one from the other. I tried basically to do uh, uh, an investigation of how many of these characters are uh, basically can be taken as standard version of the, I mean, basically equal to the uh, standard script after the Qin unification, and which one are either Jia Jie or just conjectures. Um, so, if you count it, the, the Guardian text more or less contain around 12,000 characters. Now, I, I did a sample of around 1,500, so I could control it quite well. And let's say that out of 1,500, around 1,000 just stand for what is called them. So the same character. You don't need to have any interpretation, you know, even for the Christian for the series, they're just the same. Uh, and instead, all the ones that are followed by something into brackets are around one-third, 500 out of 1,500. Now, most of them, let's say 70% of these 500, 70% of these characters that require, anyway, a kind of re-transcription. They need to be interpreted in terms of the standard script. 70% uh, are trivial. I mean, they basically have the same phonetic components, uh, the same situation. Uh, around 20% are <coughs> less trivial, but in most cases we can get the phonological reason for going to one, uh, one character to the other. Now we use character in a pretty informal way as representing a word that we not always uh, have the full thing. But obviously there are graphs that stands for another, uh, for uh, a word that is normally written now with a standard graph, for example, wall. Now, in some cases, this kind of equivalence could be uh, basically due to some special phonological environments. For example, this one uh, with a glottal soft corresponding to the initial nasal, it often comes in a kind of sound environment when a preceding word is followed, is ending in N, uh, which basically also reminds us of the fact that it's not really the two characters that stand for each other in general. I mean, a single text there is a single instance, countable, of a certain character standing for what we interpret to be a different another character. And, and these are the problematic ones. 
they are around in the good end around 10 percent, 10 percent of of this one third that are in general not benzene. Mm -hmm. And this one, in some cases, are just conjectural. I mean, they just seem from the context within that are unknown, but they can be broken into known parts. Sometimes it, the fact that we break it into known parts doesn't help, but they're still basically un unknown entities. But they uh, often, uh, they, they cite, for example, this Shazing, or they cite books that have um, a related version from that uh, matching uh, word or character in that environment, we assume that this unknown thing should match with a known character in that received passage, and sometimes just from the context. Uh, in other cases, it's basically just a very continuous, consistent way to read, uh, to write one character as another. I mean, Ren, in, in the manuscript, is written with Shen radical and, and the heart, uh, which is also okay phonologically, by the way, but, but it's this is kind of a, it's still a special case, um, it's still more complex than this, but at the same time it's a straightforward equivalent, it holds all the time. Most of these others are really like blank boxes, in a certain sense, we don't know them very well. The way we deal with these graphs is first of all we try to locate them into a dictionary of, of graphs, and, and this is still the, the reference, but uh, basically, uh, the state of the field, the fact that the field is basically just really starting to give us tools, uh, is clear from the fact that this dictionary has been conceived before all these discoveries. I mean, before the discoveries of the Guadiana. It doesn't really have data from the Guadiana Shambor and Shinkong. But it's still the best we have. Uh, but we integrate it with other things. We integrate it basically from, with data from databases. Academia, Sinica, Wuhan, uh, Chinese U. Uh, you enter form and they give you all the variant forms. So obviously, it's according to their interpretation of what that form already is. You cannot just have an unknown character and try to find it out. You can just, through these searches, see how a given known character is represented in different texts according to each editor. And obviously, this, each one of this is an editorial decision that this is indeed this, this character. In many cases, this is trivial. In other cases, is potentially problematic. Uh, the source I'm focusing on here is Bayulan's dictionary. I did it because it allows me at a very small scale to test some claims put forward in the book, which used Bayulan in six, seven occasions, <coughs> is never for very major things. I'm not trying to have a, an overall outlook on the reconstruction as such, just to see basically two things, how the two script is used to build this theory and eventually if this system can lead to better practice in paleography, if it can help paleographers to read texts. Now this is the, the, the version of the text uh, cited in, in the book 2008. This is the one, the latest, 2012. It's three times larger, almost one and a half. Um, partly it reflects the fact that really there is an enormous amount of work going on in this field. Uh, but partly also basically makes more explicit what is already here. And here it's really called a dictionary. Here is more like really a collection of glosses. But yeah, it's really basically a collection of glosses. Meaning it just Problematic characters, well, more or less problematic, that would be treated if the sources were not manuscript sources in, in a normal Jiajie dictionary, are treated by Bailan in this dictionary because when I mean, they come from, from manuscript sources. Uh, and at the same time, quite clearly, each one of them reflects a specific editor's view on a specific problematic character. Now we look basically at three claims, three claims that are made in the book and kind of test how the usage of Bayulan is related to this issue of testing the system. How, because the fact that the claims are based on this version and there is an expanded version that is basically 250% more data that basically allows you to check if how things have been going in the past, not only a few years, but just the material is much more. 
So there are three claims that I'm looking at. Uh, and one of them is about what I call split of Gong and Gong, which means I kind of use the terminology that Baxter and Langito used, <coughs> basically when he was uh, looking at evidence <coughs> of having one rhyme category that was traditionally treated as a single one, uh, splitting them into two. If basically there is no inter-rhyming between the subset, then you treat it, but you can split the category. In a certain sense, this is something similar, meaning these two words have the same Middle Chinese transcription. And they were, in general, reconstructed also with the same Old Chinese reconstruction. Uh, so one of the rationales for this different reconstruction here, one with a meter and the other with a uvula, is that in BYL by Yudan, uh, there are pages and pages listing uh, words that are in JJ connection with Gung and in JJ connection with Gung, and the two series don't overlap. Uh, which basically means that, at least in the manuscripts uh, in, represented in the book, uh, the two sets really seem to be more than just uh, separated by chance. There seems to be a systematic way in which the two sets, the sets are distinguished. Uh, plus, uh, Gung, reconstructed with the uvular, serves as phonetic for characters that are also reconstructed with the uvular. So it's consistent. It's basically uh, an hypothesis is made, then it is defended on the basis of new evidence from the manuscript, um, and then additional uh, reasons are given. Um, now, in Bayonet 2012, there is <coughs> one counterexample. In fact, the counterexample is slightly <coughs> indirect, it's not exactly from Gong, but it's from Gong, which is basically still with a Wheeler, and which interchange with an Uvular here. So Gong writes Wong. Now, we saw first that Wong was reconstructed with an Uvular, and uh, it should according to the pattern we see, should not have interchanged with a leader. What I want to point out, here I have my small advertisement of my own translation of the passage, but uh, it, it's also that it's basically one solution to one specific textual problem. The graph is this. Uh, at least this is the way it's transcribed. There is Gong here, there is Jiu, and then there is the, the vessel part. So, so here. So these three parts. So it's quite clear, uh, it seems quite clear uh, that the phonetic is Gong. So uh, Now the story is about a duke that basically has a uh, understand how things really are, he's a good ruler, and a younger ruler that is supposed to take over but doesn't understand at all how things are in the world. So the, the story is that he goes around in the, in, in the countryside, looks at peasant family, and look at how you cook pickled sauce, and he understands that you need to do it in a special way. I mean, he knows how you do even this kind of very small minutiae, so he's a good ruler. His son doesn't even know how to recognize hand in a field, doesn't have a clue. So that's the way you kind of understand the, what is going on in the text. And this is the point where we make the decision. We where it's gone and we decide it should be well, an earthen jar. Okay. So it should be an earthen jar that should not be covered in the process of cooking. Where does this come from? It comes from Chen Jian which, I mean, if you know how it proceeds, is an excellent quality, but we're not too careful about the <coughs> chronological details in most cases. But this is, at the same time, a typical entry from Ban Yunnan. This is an entry. Uh, and what I want to point out in the spirit of this falsifiability is that basically when Ban Yunnan has his five pages of uh, borrowings from Gong and then for the other Gong and then they, they don't overlap. Uh, his sources for putting together all this list is basically textual glosses like the one Chen Jian put there in this case. 
So there are two different issues. The fact if Shenzhen is justified here in having that uh, gloss, if we would consider this a um, mistake or just phonologically unsound, and the fact that uh, in the book, the fact that uh, Gong and Gong consistently do not interrhyme in this, in, in this two jia jia system is considered a fact. It's not problematized as a set of hypotheses of different scholars taken and uh, put together by, by you know, it's basically the fact of the language. And I'm basically emphasizing that often, often there are textual reasons to choose one, uh, one reading against another. And these reasons might not be controllable, but at the same time, they end up in the pool of data that is treated as a fact. So sometimes this, uh, there are issues of falsifiability, meaning are you, is the data like this just going to be uh, taken out as problematic, but then what about the, all the other data? Have they been tested the same way to check that they were not conditioned by similar contextual reason or with possibly uh, problematic uh, phonological reasons. So this is one example. The other example is actually a kind of confirmation. It is not a counter example. Uh, there are two series, Yang and Yang, uh, similar homophones in Little Chinese, uh, reconstructed uh, with an uvular for, for Yang because uh, of, uh, of connection with uh, Sietian series, uvular items. Uh, this other item uh, as connection that basically lead to uh, reconstructed with the liquid. Because it, it's in itself there is a sort of consensus that you reconstruct uh, Middle Chinese Yo Y as having these two sources. At the same time, uh, Bayuna again neatly provides these two non overlapping sets. The new edition has one exception, but this is not a real exception because we know the two merged. They only merge after the bamboo manuscript. So this manuscript, uh, by now, is not only bamboo manuscript, this is Han Dynasty manuscript. So the only example when the two interchange is from the Han Dynasty. This is fine. This is actually something that comes as, let's say, testable new evidence, and the evidence is in favor of the, what is represented in the book. So it can go both ways. Wu uh, and Wu also, almost uh, in Middle Chinese, reconstructed in different ways. Now, uh, one of the reasons to reconstruct uh, Wu as uh, <coughs> having a uvular is that there are contacts. Uh, there are uh, Sietian contacts and there are word family. Uh, relationship with uvular. So this is again the hypothesis. On this kind of hypothesis, we just think that, uh, sure, the two uh, series should be separated. But here, the counterexamples are very numerous, actually. In fact, they are treated in, in a separate note in the book, because it's the case where really uh, counterexamples are in large number. Now, uh, what is considered a genuine counterexample in the note, meaning a counterexample that is simply not explained away, a counterexample that is simply recognized as an exception, is this one. This one because there is a matching passage, I think, from Shu uh, that basically makes extremely unlikely that here we should have anything else by you, resistance. So this is recognized. But this one is cited and not recognized. I mean, Bailan gives this gloss, but it is possible to give this other gloss. Now, how is it possible? This, this table will basically give you an idea of why I consider the system is it is not out of control, but it's a system that is still very <coughs> problematic to deal with. Uh, the alternative explanation of this word as bien, which obviously cannot be on phonological ground, it's not on phonological similarity, is this graphic element. Is one of the graphic elements, perhaps the most ubiquitous, mysterious graphic element in, in the in the quotidian in the script, because it really seems to serve for well, 
widely different uh, modern word, Chao Bian Jian Qian. It stands for all this in different contexts, and so it's a kind of jolly element that can serve different purposes. I mean, it probably we just didn't crack it the right way. Probably there are at least two subsets. But what I mean is that the alternative hypothesis of having Bien here comes from the fact that the graph involved is this graph. So, well, this unknown, basically, graph that can stand for so many other graphs. Which also means it's perhaps uh, an easy way to get away from, from a textual problem. I mean, if equally, it would have been equally possible to, to choose one of the other candidates. And at this point, how do we choose if we should have words <coughs> or we should have debates? Well, in good part, from the context and plus on polygraphical grounds. Uh, this is a dialogue between Confucius and Zixia. And Zixia is saying basically that the words Confucian are beautiful. Uh, perhaps it's preferable to keep words instead of like debate there, but again, it's a textual issue. Um, I have one more uh, example. This example is based on a graph, again, that is quite interesting in the Quodian gene. It's interesting because quite clearly it doesn't match with the phonology. It, the, the end final uh, uh, gene would not serve for something that is pronounced with ing. Uh, so it, it, is, it has been surmised for, for a long time that actually the, the phonetic is lean. And furthermore, lean and mean, these are just very important, but they are basically almost interchangeable. In, in, in so here I, you know, it might seem a bit fussy in going over these minor details, but I'm basically just trying to see what can be justified, what can be tested, and what is very difficult to test in this subset. So this is straight from uh, our text, and it says that uh, also taking into consideration the fact that Jing and Ming are, uh, Ling and Ming are related, so perhaps we should actually split Jing alternate claim into its two meanings, because we know it has two meanings. One is boastful, and the other one is pity. So the proposal here is that probably the boastful meaning come from me, to command, and the pity meaning come from Rin, Lian, to, to be compassionate. Pity. Now, this is all possible, but how do we test something like this? Obviously, Sometimes if you don't make even, I mean, the, the issue maybe is if you should have this in a note or in the text. I mean, it's a, like an aside. It's a possible way to think about some future problem. At the same time, it's all presented in a text that is, will be a reference for, for years and present itself as a kind of careful, hypothetical, deductive text. So I'm just taking some small uh, issues with this, just showing some inconsistencies that we have uh, uh, with the true script, particularly, because it, it's a delicate thing. Similar thing is, is this. Uh, Jiu is generally recognized, not by everybody, but it's generally recognized as being the original character standing for elbow Jiu. So how do we reconcile the different, uh, uh, the different initials, T and K? Now, uh, it is difficult, obviously. It, there are two kind of supporting pieces of evidence. One is that there is a kind of a couplet. I mean, there, is a, there are two cognate words, in, in, uh, one in Tibetan and one in their own related, where basically we see that there is a, a sesquity that we prefix, or what we in Chinese would consider all this. So there is a to, kru, that could give us the kru, the complex image. And also there is a Again, a hypothesis that comes for internal reconstruction that the uh, T prefix could account for this. Again, uh, I am wondering also because I have absolutely no uh, special knowledge in, in Sino Tibetan or Tibetan Burma etymologies, but how ad hoc is having this prefix 
I mean, it's not based only. Uh, I know it doesn't come only from that uh, from that uh, relationship between Tio and, and Cho. But are there only five? I mean, it just seems to be a, as a supporting evidence if there are only five or six, and one is problematic. Almost 15, 20 percent of the evidence is, is problematic. Uh, the last example, maybe a bit out, oh, but uh, uh, more or less I'm dead. Uh, comes from uh, an example in the Chambord that I, something that I bumped into. So this is a place name. Place names are particularly unreliable. You, you never know exactly how they're written. But from the context, <coughs> it's the only way we can make sense of this food, which is skin, uh, is that a certain king has lands in, in a certain territory. It's not that huge. Obviously, initially, people, the Bumbu script are such that sometimes people thought it was about the skin problem. I mean, you, sometimes you need to reconstruct the full, uh, sometimes you really understand the single passage based on a single word and go around it. But now that we have a decent understanding of the text, we have no doubt that this should be a place name. And once we know it's a place name, we know from the chronicle this is a true king. We know which time it fits that he actually had this new territory conquered. Uh, it fits for the rhyming, but what about the initial? I mean, the initial, people accept it, uh, because it seems to make the better sense in the context. But again, can we, <laughs> how do we justify it? Maybe we cannot, or maybe we can. I mean, can we test it? Obviously, there is no prefix P, but it, it's just another example of things that are problematic, but editors take, make these decisions, I mean, most of the time. They, the text we read, the text that by Yilan will have as his entry, has this Jiajie relationship. The conclusion is that uh, the evidence from the true script is often problematic, uh, that sometimes, at least in this case, uh, it's not clear how you test certain hypotheses, and especially it's not clear what is given as a normal, suitable way to test this hypothesis. Maybe there is no general suitable. Uh, I also, as a basically practitioner in the field that uses reconstructions to to make decisions about Jia Jie, I'm still using Schussler basically with that one because it's more systematized, but it's based on Baxter 92. I don't think it's yet. Uh, I mean, it's really a task for for the future to make to make the old Chinese new reconstruction to to make day-to-day -day decisions about uh, Jia Jie. Okay.